sure that we do that for people who can't come, but welcome to Bible study. Uh, for we're going to continue on in, let me share my screen. All right, so you should be able to see that now with the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and we have made it to uh, chapter 16, which is a little bit past the middle. And we'll be talking about the leaven or uh, of the Pharisees or, or the yeast is some um, versions use. And then Peter's declaration of Jesus's Messiahship, um, which happens at Caesarea Philippi. So is somebody willing to read the first section for us to unmute and read Matthew 16 verses one through 12? I can read. Thanks, Gary. Matthew 16, 1 through 12. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tried to catch him out by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. This was his reply to them. When it's evening, you say, sky looks like wine, it's going to be fine. And in the morning, you say, run in the sky, rain by and by. Well, then, you know how to work out the look of the sky, so why can't you work out the signs of the times? The generation that wants a sign is wicked and corrupt. No sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. With that, he left them and went away. When the disciples crossed over the lake, they forgot to bring any bread. Watch out, Jesus said to them and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed it with each other. It's because we didn't bring any bread, they said. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. You really are of a little faith lot, he said. Why are you discussing with each other that you haven't got any bread? Don't you understand even now? Don't you remember the five loaves and the 5,000? And how many bas basketfuls you picked up afterwards? Or the seven loaves and the 4,000 and how many baskets you picked up? Why can't you see that I wasn't talking about bread? Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he wasn't telling them to beware of leaven you get in bread but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Gary. A reminder that we just had the feeding of the 4,000 was our, I mean, we've had a pretty long break. So um, that's just happened. And I think uh, N.T. Wright comes out from, from the UK. So I've always, you know, from growing up in Virginia Beach, heard if the sky, uh, red sky at night is a sailor's, uh, delight red sky in the morning is a sailor's warning. I think that's how it goes. Same, same sort of idea. Um, but N.T. Wright uh, begins by saying, our generation is bombarded with signs. Uh, drive along a city street, especially at night, and your eyes will be dazzled with signs of all sorts. Some of them are necessary to tell you where to go and where not to go. You know, if you ignore red and green lights, you will be in danger. And I think I'll Far too many people ignore red lights here in Prince William County, so I'm even more cautious now at stop lights. Uh, others are merely for decoration, other signs, uh, for information, pointing to particular buildings or illuminating them. Many, many others are designed to catch your imagination and your money. Advertisements twinkle and flash enticingly until their message has worked its way into your memory. Part of growing up is learning to distinguish signs that matter, which must be obeyed, from signs that don't matter, that can and perhaps should be ignored. Some of the same puzzle faces us as we read the Gospels. Sometimes Jesus does things which he himself speaks of as signs, particularly in John's Gospel, but also in others. Some of his powerful deeds, especially his healings, are seen as signs of who he is. Signs that the disciples, at least, and probably others as well, are meant to notice, to read, uh, to understand. But when the Pharisees and Sadducees ask for a sign, something different is going on. And now notice that they don't normally work together. They must have regarded this as something of an emergency, this Jesus problem. Um, I'll add that the Pharisees often added to God's word with traditions and rules 
And the Sadducees were known kind of for subtracting from God's word. Now, Matthew says they were trying to catch him out like it was a test or a trick uh, for them. Perhaps they were wanting to accuse him again of being in league with the devil. Remember, they did that in chapter 12. Perhaps they were hoping to bring a charge against him that he was a false prophet using signs and wonders to lead Israel astray, as the scripture had warned in Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5. Perhaps Jesus saw their challenge as being like the cynicism of Israel in the wilderness, putting God to the test to see whether he was really among them or not, like that, uh, that happened again in Exodus 17. In any case, Jesus refused to comply with this request. He would not perform signs to order as though he had to pass some kind of test. To do so would be to treat God um, himself as some kind of circus performer. Of course, Jesus was doing all sorts of signs. The gospel story is full of them, and he longed for people to be able to read the signs of the times, to see the gathering storm clouds in Israel's national life, to recognize the way in which corrupt leaders, false teachers, and people bent on violence were leading the nation towards inevitable disaster from which only repentance and a fresh trust in God's kingdom could save them. The irony, of course, was that they were asking him for a sign, but they were blind to the many signs all around them. So he refused to perform some special sign just for them. His powerful works were done from love, not from a desire to submit his mission to kind of a laboratory test, N.T. Wright states. They weren't that kind of thing. The only sign he would give such people, as he said before, was the sign of Jonah. And he quotes this in Matthew 12, verse 38 through 42. But it, it, um, would somebody be willing to, to read this? Unmute themselves and read the, the Matthew 12, where he explains the sign of Jonah. Can you hear me? Yes, just get a little closer to your mic, okay. and you'll be good. Go ahead. How's that? A little better. Okay. Matthew 12, 38 through 42. Teacher, responded some of the scribes and Pharisees, we'd like to see a sign from you. This wicked and immoral generation is looking for a sign, replied Jesus, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Jonah, you see, was in the stomach of the sea monster for three days and three nights. And in the same way, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment along with this generation and will condemn it. They, after all, repented when they heard Jonah's warnings. And in case you hadn't noticed, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will be raised at the judgment with this generation and will condemn it. She, after all, came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And in case you hadn't noticed, something greater than Solomon is here. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Before I take the scripture down, again, this was many months ago when we looked at chapter 12. So does anybody recognize then what the sign of Jonah is? You guys can interrupt and answer. I don't usually do questions in the middle, but. His death and resurrection. Right, it's his death and resurrection, exactly right. Um, so that's the, the only sign he's gonna give the Pharisees and Sadducees. And, and he's basically being, you guys are, are, are you're missing the main point. Even the Ninevites, you know, just listening to Jonah um, repented and, and the queen of the South, queen of Sheba, um, you know, came from far away just to hear the wisdom of Solomon, but you're missing the main point here. Um, you know, if people watched him with only cynicism and criticism in their hearts, they would see nothing until that moment when the rumor went around that he had been raised from the dead. That would be the final and devastating sign that God had indeed been with him all along, with Jesus. The truth of the matter, of course, was that both the Pharisees and the Sadducees, in their different ways, held aims, beliefs, and hopes which were seriously out of line with those Jesus was offering. Like established political parties that suddenly become aware of a new movement threatening to undermine their support, they're ready to do anything to discredit it. It's kind of like our uh, rival political parties today seeing a third 
party coming up and rising to power and banding together, if you can imagine that, to, to get rid of it. But Jesus not only sees through this plot, he has his own warning to give them instead. Like a parent teaching a child not to be led astray by the flashy signs of city advertisements, he warns them of the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, this was puzzling to the disciples who thought Jesus was referring cryptically to the fact they'd forgotten to bring bread with them. And it's even more puzzling to us because unless we've grown up knowing something about Judaism, we probably don't know what leaven or this yeast could stand for. Now, at this point, the point's this. At, at Passover, uh, one of the greatest Jewish festivals that we just celebrated, uh, the Jews just celebrated, all the leaven had to be cleared out of their house, commemorating the time when the children of Israel left Egypt in such a hurry that they didn't have time to bake leavened bread. Um, and, and so they ate it unleavened. And if you'll notice, even when I, we did our Monday Thursday service, I purposely used um, unleavened bread for that. Now, gradually, leaven or yeast became a symbol, not for something that makes bread more palatable, but for something that makes it less pure. So warning against the leaven of someone's teaching meant warning against the ways in which the true message of God's kingdom could be corrupted or diluted, or as we say now, uh, nowadays, referring to a drink rather than bread, it's kind of been diluted or watered down. So bring the whole scene forward 2,000 years, and we face the question for ourselves, what are the signs of our times in our own day? Where are leaders and teachers, official and unofficial leading people astray? What are the true signs of God's work in our midst? And how can we learn to tell the difference and our moral and spiritual life together between the signs we must observe and those we would do better to ignore? And those are the questions that N.T. Wright leaves us with, some difficult and uh, heavy ones. So I'll begin uh, with the first question I kind of had in the email I sent out is, how does Jesus explain his response to the demand of the Pharisees and Sadducees for a sign? What does Jesus basically tell them? Catch that? He tells them, don't worry about the leaven. I'm not talking about the leaven. You have to look beyond that. Right. The very beginning of the passage, he uses the, the red sky at night as a sailor's delight, right? And the red sky in the morning is a sailor's morning. So he's basically saying, you notice what? You can figure out the weather. You can read those signs, and how are you missing what? My sign. Right. The stuff that's kind of right in front of your face, right? And so his answer to them when they're like, give me a sign is what? Does he do that request? He says, no, I'm not giving you a sign just because you asked for one. And then he refers to uh, the sign of Jonah which Carol read, and what was that sign, which hasn't happened yet at this point, it's what? Three days. Three right. Nights. The resurrection, right? The death and resurrection that just like Jonah was in the belly of the, we always like to say whale because of all the songs, but it says sea monster in the Hebrew, in the sea monster, and Jonah was regurgitated back out uh, after three days, Jesus died and rose again right after three days. And so that is the only sign you need to recognize uh, who I am. But really there are signs all around, right? Any other thoughts about this before we move on? I just on? had a question on sure. the context because at the end of 15, they get in a boat and then the first five uh, verses we're talking uh, there's a conversation between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then five says disciples reach the other side. So I'm just a little confused about, you know, what's going on from a context point of view. Right. So let's see. I'm make sure I'm telling you right. Uh, so the feeding of the four thousands. So at the end of verse 15 is after sending away the crowds, he got into a boat and went to the region of Magadan. And then, so he's, that is, um, 
make sure I'm telling you right. So I think he, he went to another region and then the Pharisees and Sadducees come and test Jesus and ask him for a sign. And he basically talks about the red sky at night. And then um, he says, I'm only going to give you Jonah. And then he leaves and they get in a boat again and they go again across the lake. Does that make sense? Okay. So, right. yeah, it, sometimes, you know, the context is more clear and sometimes it's, right. you know, <laughs> leaves a little little to be desired as to, you know, uh, the travel log. <laughs> right, right. I mean, that's the way I'm reading it. I could be wrong. But I mean, they definitely get in a boat at the end of 15, like you're saying. Right. And they go to a um, Magdalon, which can also be Magdala. Uh, and I'll have to look up where that is. But and then he has this discussion with the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then after he says, but no sign will be given to you except the sign of Joseph, Jonah. And then it says, then he left them and went away. And then when the disciples reached the other side, it could also be that he traveled separately from them. I can't imagine that he would, but um, then he's with them when he, they, the disciples reach the other side. So Right, without the bread. Right, without the bread. And it's kind of... <laughs> And what's interesting, of course, is that the feeding of the 4,000 was right before this. So it's kind of like, you know, they've forgotten already that miracles, like you don't need to worry about bread. And so he to they totally miss the point that, that Jesus is kind of making here. But good question. So the sign of Jonah was previously explained, and we read that, uh, Carol did in Matthew 12, is pointing to his burial and resurrection. So just a, a question, uh, what are the true signs of God's work in our midst? That's a hard question, but can anybody think of, of ways that we see God working in the world today? Signs of the times? I think sometimes we see prayers answered. We see mir miraculous healings. Um, seeing people come to Christ is a sign, I think, that God is working in our midst. bad stuff in our world but if we really look around like i think of you know me and mr rogers well, look for the helpers right even in the midst of suffering and chaos you know there are always people helping like even in covid right we look to the frontline <laughs> healthcare workers and the scientists working on the vaccines and even folks in our own congregation who have volunteered their time to volunteer the vaccine sites and the, the nurses who have come back uh, from retirement to, to give vaccines and things like that, right? Other thoughts, other signs that God is at work in the world? Anybody have any? The little kids, I always call them God sightings, right? I always think of spring when, you know, everything's blooming and it just physically, you know, I just feel like God's everywhere all around. I was just talking with Kim about that as going out kind of a walk in nature and we can see God's handiwork all around, God's creation. I think it was John Calvin that said, all I have to do is look up at the stars. And I'm amazed at, at uh, recognizing how amazing God is. Paraphrasing. Um, any other thoughts? All right. I think this, despite all of the attitudes about it, you can look at just the existence of a vaccine as a work of God get away from all of the attitudes about it right right focus on the fact of the vaccine or that we had it so quickly usually vaccines you know take a lot longer and we have new technology and the two that aren't giving us trouble right now are the ones using that new technology and to me again i was a biology major before i went to seminary and and, and love science but i think of it as a gift from god right uh you know the old uh right the Preacher joke that I think I'm required to put at, three, at least once every three years into the sermon, you know, so the person dies and goes to heaven and uh, was at a, uh, in a boat that, that sank. And he was like, why didn't you come rescue me? And God says something like, well, I sent you the Coast Guard and the helicopter and, you know, and you, you rejected all of them. Right? So God uses science to, to help us as well. It's like a gift. Um, uh, what did Jesus mean when he spoke of the yeast and leaven of the Pharisees? I think Peter was starting to get to this question when we first started talking. Uh, what do you think he, he was mean? 
meaning here? I mean, you have NT rights take. Would it, do you agree? Thoughts? Well, I see Brad as expanding. Um, and so I think um, the, the Sadducees and Pharisees had such um, opposite view of who Jesus was and what he did um, that they were more or less you know, blocking the spread of his word. Um, that's what yeast does, is it expands. So if you take that um, figuratively speaking, you would assume that the word has not expanded right. his word. So it's interesting, they were kind of enemies that they kind of band together. Yes. Um, so a lot of people are like, well, why did Jesus, you know, die on the cross? And there's lots of examples in Matthew of reasons why he did who's not a, a, the authorities, uh, the Roman authorities and the religious powerful, the powerful religious elites of the day did not like Jesus. Even the powerful religious elites that were on opposite sides of the spectrum band together to go after Jesus, right? So, um, that's one of the reasons, you know, Christ was crucified. He was a political enemy, and he was actually a religious uh, enemy. And um, we're going to talk a little bit in the next passage about the other messiahs that were tra uh, trampling around in the first century um, in Israel, and why why Jesus often tells people not to tell anybody about what just happened is really a safety mechanism. Um, so again. This is, goes back to knowing about the Passover and remember the story of, of Egypt is when they had to flee, they go into the Red Sea, they couldn't wait for the bread to rise, so they ate, they packed unleavened bread. And so leaven or yeast um, becomes this idea of impurity or even evil um, for a Jewish person. So he's saying, be aware of the, the evil and the impurity that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are putting into God's word and God's kingdom message, right? So it's like, um, it's not that their message is completely wrong. It's that they're taking it and they're corrupting it, right? Does that make sense? So it's like a corruption of this good thing uh, that God has given, which is God's law and, and the Old Testament is like, they, they've corrupted it. They've either made it too legalistic and added all these rules what the Pharisees did, but they started taking away parts like the Sadducees. So beware of that. You know, um, let's see the next question. Jump in if you have anything else. Jesus refused to offer signs to impress the public or engage in self aggrandizement. Um, how should we evaluate leaders and teachers, official and unofficial, on these criteria? Do you think there's anything to learn here about the way Jesus handles? Um, signs on evaluating leaders? It, it, it's best if they could figure out um, on their own rather than have him uh, tell them and be disbelievers. His parables are so strong and easy to get if they're willing. Right. If you're, if you're <laughs> if listening. They, with their eyes they see. Right. Um, so if you think about leaders today, good leaders and bad leaders, what would might be a sign that we have a bad leader from this teaching of Jesus here? If they're out for who? If they're, they're out, out for themselves. themselves. Right, right, as they're trying to build their name, their brand, uh, they're about, uh, you know, I think of the often the kind of prosperity gospel preachers who are making millions and millions of dollars and living in, in mansions kind of give Christianity a bad name, right? Um, because this, their, their idea is they're not promoting um, Christ and, and the kingdom message. They're trying to kind of, you know, promote themselves. So that's a big red flag and warning sign for us, right? When we evaluate leaders and we could take that out of the religious spectrum too, is even our politicians on both sides of the aisle Right when they stop listening to the people and trying to make um, the world a, a nation, a county, or whatever a better place for the constituents, um, when they're in it to just get reelected, right? 
um, that's a, a, a warning sign too. And so Jesus saying is, I'm not going to fall into that trap. I'm not going to give you a sign just so that you guys can you know, be impressed by me or, or believe me then. Um, you know, uh, we're going to, I'm going to do, do the, take the high road here. Any thoughts about that? Other ideas? Agree? Disagree? Sadducees and the Pharisees sound a bit like this country. Right, right. So, so supposedly divided. I'm not sure I believe that 100%. Um, pe some people uh, want to see us divided. I didn't hear the last part you said, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think there are those who want to see us divided. Right, right. It keeps them in power, right? Instead of coming together and compromising and listening and talking to one another, right? So uh, those are on the, the fringes. And see the Sadducees and Pharisees were kind of fringes of the Jewish religious establishment. There are other religious groups. You don't hear them mentioned as much, um, at least in the, the gospel narratives. Um, so... Another question before we get to the next section. The disciples seem more dense about Jesus's meaning regarding the yeast of the Pharisees. Uh, when have you realized that God was trying to say something to you? It took you a, a while to understand. And that can be a private question that you think about, or maybe you're willing to share. But I mean, has ever, that ever happened to you as you're like, oh my gosh, like five years later, you're like, oh, that's what God was trying to say to me. Or it just took me a long time to get it. Uh, anybody? experience that yes yeah sometimes it takes i always joke at god takes me a god whacking me upside the head with a two by four before i come to like that a realization sometimes so we can be dense just like the disciples i know i can so um, I, I think it's a uh, a process it's a journey and um sad to say you know it's taken um many years of maturity for me to get it right and so again, it takes us all time and Jesus loved the disciples and walked with them and still built the church with these disciples who were dense as us. <laughs> and we just pray for discernment and for the ears to hear and understand in the moment. I'm going to mute everybody. We're going to do our typical uh, middle of the class musical break. Um, I was always, I'm always looking for fun stuff. So, you know, I'm a fan. I'm going to share the screen, make sure I have this so you guys can hear this of the, the little girl from the Crosby family. Um, she is now, I think, eight years old. And she's now recording stuff with her dad. Her dad was a musician. I didn't know her mom sang until this video either. But um, they always come out with a new video at Easter. And this is uh, one of their new ones. And so I, I ran across it and thought you guys would enjoy Come Thou Font of Ever Blessing. Uh, the Crosbys live in um, California. And uh, they are of a Protestant faith tradition that waits for believers baptism. So um, the little girl was just baptized about three weeks ago, which is exciting, I think, for them, but uh, enjoy. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount I'm fixed upon it mount of thy redeeming I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger wandering. 
So anyway, that's Claire Crosby. I forgot to mention her first name. Um, I've played other things by her before. Um, I still want to know how they get a piano in the middle of a field. Uh, I do know they climbed a mountain for that one. So, but you can find her on YouTube. If, I just think I she's- I noticed they didn't drag the piano up the hill. Right, they did not put the piano on top of the mountain. I think that would require like a, a helicopter or something. So, um, but. Anyway, all right, we're going to move on to our next um, scripture. If somebody's willing to unmute and read chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Peter's declaration of Jesus's Messiahship. If somebody was willing to read, that'd be great. 13 to 20. I'll be glad to do that. Okay. When Jesus came to the region, where are we? Yeah, when Jesus came to the region of Caesar of Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do, the pe who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much. So N.T. Wright starts by talking about how Tibetan Buddhists believe in the uh, trans uh, migrate migration of souls. So when somebody dies, they suppose that the soul of that person goes immediately into a different body, the body of a child born at the very same instant. This belief becomes uh, vitally important when their spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, dies. A search is made for a boy born at the very moment when the great leader died, and that boy is taken away and brought up as the new leader. Everybody, including the person uh, himself, knows from the very beginning that he is the new Dalai Lama. It sounds very strange to modern Western ears. We prize highly the right of every person for freedom of choice about their future. Even hereditary monarchs can abdicate the throne, but the Dalai Lama has no choice and there is no question about who he is. 
In Judaism, it was very different. Many Jews of Jesus' day believed, and many Jews today still believe this, that God would send an anointed king who would be the spearhead of the movement that would free Israel from oppression and bring justice and peace to the world at last. Nobody knew when or where this anointed king would be born, though many believed he would be a true descendant of David, King David. God made a wonderful promise about his future family, and some would have pointed to this prophecy that you see on your screen in Micah 5, uh, verses 1 through 3, and uh, Matthew actually quotes part of that in chapter 2. If somebody's willing to unmute and read just Matthew 2, verses 5 through 6. I will. Thanks. Betsy. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, that's what it says in the prophet. You, Bethlehem, in Judah's land are not the least of Judah's princes. From out of you will come the ruler who will, who will shepherd Israel, my people. Thank you. So again, this indicates that the coming king would be born where? In Bethlehem. And of course, we hear all of this passage often at Advent and Easter time. Now, the word for anointed king in the Jewish languages, Hebrew and Aramaic, was the word we normally pronounce as Messiah. Now, what would the Messiah be like? How would people tell that he had arrived? No one knew exactly, but there were many, many theories. Many saw him as a warrior king who would defeat the pagan hordes and establish Israel's freedom. Many um, saw... Uh, him as one who would purge the temple and establish true worship. Everybody who believed in such a coming king knew that he would fulfill Israel's scriptures and bring God's kingdom into being at last on earth as it is or was in heaven. But nobody had a very clear idea about what all this would look like on the ground. In the first century, there were several would-be messiahs who came and went, attracting followers who were quickly dispersed when their leader was caught by the authorities. One thing, though, was for certain. To be known as a would-be Messiah was to attract the attention from the authorities and almost certain hostility. So when Jesus wanted to put the question to his followers, uh, he took them away, well far away, of their normal sphere of activity to Caesarea Philippi, which is in the far north of the land of Israel, well outside the territory of Herod Antipas, a good two days' walk from the Sea of Galilee. And if you'll remember, I've actually preached on this passage in August, and I showed this picture of Caesarea Philippi. It's also known as the City of Pagans, and these niches were carved out of an area where there was a spring, um, and it was kind of the religious center of the worship of the god Pan. In fact, the Greeks renamed the city Paneus in his honor, Years later, the Romans conquered the territory, and Herod Philip rebuilt the city and named it after himself. So it was Peneus and then became Caesarea Philippi. It continued to focus, though, on the worship of these Greek gods. And in that cliff that I just showed you, stood above, uh, above the city, local people built shrines and temples to the god Pan. So in these little niches would be little gods, and this big one would have probably had uh, the god Pan. And in that pagan setting, uh, he encouraged his disciples, Jesus did, to build a church that would overcome the worst evils of the world. To the pagan mind, the cave right under those um, niches in Caesarea Philippi created a gate to the underworld where the fertility gods lived during the winter and they would um, come out in the spring um, and commit detestable acts of worship to these false gods. So basically, when Jesus brought his disciples to this area, they must have been shocked. You know, Caesarea Philippi was kind of like the red light district in their world, and devout Jews would have avoided this area and any contact with the despicable acts committed there. It was a city of people really eagerly knocking literally on the doors or gates of hell. So standing near this, the pagan temples of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter boldly replies, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And the disciples were probably stirred by the contrast between Jesus, the true and living God, and these false hopes of the pagans who trusted in these dead God, these statues that were around here. Um, even the form, uh, and another thing I would say is he brought the disciples here far, far away from Galilee, probably for safety, for having this Messiah discussion for the first time. Even the form of 
the question here in Matthew's gospel is at least oblique. Who do people say the son of man is? That is, who do people say that this person here, in other words, but without saying it, is I myself am? Jesus must have known the answer he would get, but he wanted the disciples to say it out loud, N.T. Wright suggests. The disciples report the general reaction, which tells us a good deal about the way Jesus was perceived by the people at large. Not a gentle Jesus, meek and mild, not the cozy, comforting friend of the little children, rather like one of the wild prophets of recent or ancient times who stood up and spoke um, against, uh, spoke God's word fearlessly against wicked and rebellious kings. Jesus was acting as a prophet, not simply one who foretells the future, but one who was God's mouthpiece against injustice and wickedness in high places. But within that prophetic ministry, there lay a hidden another dimension. And Jesus believed, otherwise he would scarcely have asked the question, that his followers had finally grasped the secret. He was not just God's mouthpiece. He was God's Messiah. He was not just speaking God's word against wicked rulers of the time. He was God's king who would supplant them. That was indeed the conclusion they had reached. And Peter takes on the role of a spokesperson here, right? He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, it's important to be clear that at this stage, the phrase son of God did not mean the second person of the Trinity, which we will mind, our minds will immediately jump to. There was no thought yet about the coming king being himself divine, though some of the things Jesus was doing and saying must already have made the disciples very puzzled with a perplexity that would have only be resolved when after his resurrection, they came to believe that he had all along been even more intimately associated with Israel as one God than they had ever imagined. No, the phrase son of God was a biblical phrase for them, indicating that the king stood in a particular relation to God, adopted to kind of be God's special representative. Very soon after Jesus's resurrection, though, his followers came to believe that that same phrase had a whole nother layer of meaning that nobody kind of had ever yet imagined, and that is that Jesus was, in fact, God's son and divine. But it's important if we are to understand this present passage that we don't read more into it than it's really there. What Peter and the others were saying was this, you are the true king, Jesus. You're the one Israel has been waiting for. You are God's adopted son, the one of whom the Psalms and the prophets had spoken. They knew this was risky to say this. With this, they were not only signing on to be part of a prophetic movement that challenged existing authorities in God's name, they were signing on for a royal challenge. Jesus was the true king. That meant that Herod and even far away Caesar had better look out. And as for the temple authority as well, to begin with, it looked as though Jesus was simply endorsing their dreams. If Peter had declared that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus had a word for Peter as well. The name Peter, or in his native Aramaic, Cephas, means rock or stone. And if Peter was prepared to say that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus was prepared to say that with this allegiance, Peter would himself be the foundation for his new building. Just as God gave Abram the name Abraham, indicating that he would be the father of many nations, so now Jesus gives Simon the new name Peter, or the rock. Furthermore, just as the Sermon on the Mount, uh, just as in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told a story about a wise man building his house upon a rock. So now Jesus himself declares that he's going to do just that. And remember that picture I showed you before, He's standing literally next to a rock that represents the gates of Hades. Jesus is saying, I'm going to build a kingdom that's going to overcome this, that's going to be a, a kind of more than anything you can ask for imagine. So here, as they uh, were meant to imagine the background, um, and, and N.T. Wright doesn't talk about Caesarea Philippi as the gates of hell. He also says you could also look at it as the city of Jerusalem built on the rocky heights of Mount Zion. And in some Jewish traditions, the temple in Jerusalem was the place where heaven and earth met and where the gates of the underworld as well were to be found. So there's two different readings of this. I like to think of Caesarea Philippi the, the way um, uh, 
trying to remember the the theologian's name who uh, did the video series we did before this thinks of that as the gates of the underworld, but also some scholars argue that it's Jerusalem. But Jesus is basically declaring that he's reconstructing um, the centerpiece of God's world here. Jesus isn't going to build an actual city or an actual temple. He's going to build a community consisting of all those who give allegiance to him as God's anointed king. And this movement, this community starts then and there at Caesarea Philippi with this declaration from Peter. For the moment, this must remain, though, a deadly secret. If it were to leak out, it could become uh, deadly indeed. But to those who agree with Peter that Jesus of Nazareth really is God's Messiah, this promise is made that through this allegiance, they will become the people through whom the living God will put the world to rights, bringing heaven and earth into a new state of justice and peace. Peter, with this declaration of faith, will be the starting point of this community. Peter has much to learn and many failures to overcome, including one in the very next passage that we'll study next week. But even this is part of the process. Jesus's new community, after all, will consist simply of forgiven sinners, and I would add, just like us. So uh, when Jesus asks his disciples who people thought he was, the disciples don't say cozy, comforting friend of children or the gentle Jesus, meek and mild. They compared him to prophets of the past. Now, what do you know about prophets of the past or even current prophets? Were they meek and mild and friends of little children? This is the blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesus that's often in our churches. They were bold and confrontational at times, and they were seeking um, change and, click, you know, wanted us to, yeah. <laughs> right, turn around and correct our wicked ways. Um, they were also not usually, um, who was not a fan of the prophet? leaders, right? The religious leaders, the political leaders, they were often at odds. Often prophets met pretty bad ends because of this. And so again, we see Jesus is more of being seen, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, as a prophet who's at odds with the religious leadership, with the Roman leadership. Um, you know, this is the table flipper Jesus that it seems like people are, are recognizing here, not the the Jesus that welcomes the children on his knee. Not that Jesus is in both of those things, but Matthew, the author of Matthew, really wants to highlight Jesus the prophet here. Uh, Makes sense? All right. So um, let's see. Sorry. Share. Next question. So another question, uh, two questions really, is who do you say Jesus is? And so what does this then mean for your life? So, simple answer, I guess. Who do you say Jesus is? And then what does this mean for your life? Thoughts? Or who do we say Jesus is? And what does that mean for us as a church is another way to put it. Well, Lord and Savior. And the Savior is the... The, the truly important part of that. Right. And so if that's who we say Jesus is, what does that mean then for us as a community of faith or as individuals? What do you guys think? Does it have to be Gary that answers? I think it says that um, he's number one and we should act in that way too often. I, for one, uh, slide the other way, and I'm not proclaiming his Lord. There's a really good video series called I Am Second, people talking about it. Gaylene, Tori, I think you guys unmuted. Thoughts? I would just say that just, you know, that, that he's our savior just means that we're forgiven. We have a place it's preparing a place for us that we will have eternal lives. Right. And so I always add is, is that's the good news, right? And so then that also means then that we're called to live differently 
So one of the phrases you probably heard me say over and over again is we're called to make earth a little bit more like heaven. So that's just what Jesus is saying here is, um, so the place where Caesarea Philippi is, if you agree with um, Vanderlyn, that was the theologian I couldn't think of, Ray Vanderlyn, the video series that talked about the gates of hell being there with the pan figures, or if you agree with N.T. Wright that he's talking about Jerusalem and the temple, that's still the place where the, the veil is there, right? That God, heaven and earth are, are it's a thin place as the Celts would say. And so we're, we're called to make uh, earth a little bit more like heaven because we have a savior, because we are forgiven people, right? It's our, our duty, so right? The, like the famous prayer, uh, God has no hands and feet on earth, but yours, right? So um, we're called to live differently as well. But you're exactly right, Galene. That's the who we say Jesus is. And so because of this good gift, out of gratitude for that, it changes how we live. Other thoughts about that? All right. So what do you think Jesus meant when he said, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church? There's lots of interpretations about this, knowing the context and situation here. What do you think uh, Jesus is saying? Any ideas? No wrong, right answer. Did he say we would be a community? Mm -hmm. Right. So remember, Peter's the one who said, gives a faith declaration, right? So some theologians will say that that's what Jesus builds community on, is, is the idea that people have faith in him. Um, you know, Peter is kind of the first one to stay, say that. Um, there's, you know, lots of other uh, kind of interpretations, but, um, you know, he's, he's the one who's willing to step out in front and be the spokesperson. My um, study Bible says that Jesus gave Peter and the other apostles the authority to preach the gospel and thus open the door to his kingdom. Right. And that, um, and Jesus most likely meant he would build his church on the rock solid truth of his identity as the son of God and that Peter had just acknowledged that. Yep, exactly right. And so, Right, and we didn't, I didn't even go into it very much here. We could have a whole lesson on the keys of the kingdom. And, and most people interpret the keys of the kingdom that Jesus gives is the, the idea that he can preach, right? And later, I think I might, we might get to that in a question in Acts. We see Peter preach, right? And convert thousands of people. Actually, that's the next slide. So that's perfect, Galen. Um, I wasn't going to have us read these. These are really long, but if you want to write these down, um, if you want to look at Acts 2, 14 through 41, and Acts 10, 34 through 43, um, again, verse 19, I'll just read it for you because we're running out of time. Uh, verse 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you tie up on earth will be tied up in heaven, and whatever you untie on earth will be untied in heaven. So what do you loose or loose? Uh, um, basically, what are these keys? Well, it's our ability, um, you know, to, um, you know, the privilege to, to tell people about the good news of Christ, right? So um, from uh, my mom gave me her notes. She says, Jesus gave Peter the privilege of being the first to use the keys to the kingdom. After Pentecost, Peter uses the keys to open the gospel door to the, the Jews living in the area and the Gentiles filled with the Holy Spirit. Preach, uh, Peter preaches here in these Acts passages to, and 3,000 people believe. Um, and when we make the gospel known, people are loosed or set free from their sins by faith in the gospel. And when a person rejects the gospel, the sinner remains bound, right, um, to that death and sin. So um, that's the idea of the loose and being bound and free, right? Other thoughts about that? Does that make sense? You know, other people, you know, define this uh, differently. Um, this is where the Catholic Church uh, gets the idea of a, a pope and of some sort of succession from Peter, they're going to claim. Um, but we're saying that anybody can have the keys of the kingdom, which is the is really just sharing good news. So the word eangelion in the Greek is to just tell people good news. And we do that all the time uh, in, in lots of different ways. I read this really good book, or I saw this really good movie. 
or you should really watch this on Netflix that's sharing good news or a good experience we had, and we need to do the same things about our lives in Christ. You know, even if it's the flip side is, you know, when I was going through a really tough time, what really helped me was my faith and my church community, you know, insert story here, uh, especially nowadays. I think that you, I don't know if you guys just saw the study that came out last week that says less than 50% of the people in North America um, belong to a church, a mosque, or a temple. Uh, or any sort of religious organization. So um, we are now officially in the minority as people of faith, and not just Christians. I'm talking about um, just people having any sort of religious faith. Most people are now nuns or um, unchurched or de-churched, as we would say. So thoughts about that? Did you guys see the study? Did you guys see that come across your news feed? When I was six, four, I just think we, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> we do. And it's to love other people and, and, and to tell them the good news. And, um, you know, I would often say, you know, preach the gospel uh, often, if necessary, use words. We need to kind of take that famous quote by Francis of C.C. and be like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's like preach the gospel often, use words. <laughs> um, it, we don't have to scare people in heaven. We don't have to bash them upside the head. It doesn't mean that we have to be... Um, not uh, religiously tolerant to people who are Muslims or Jews who have faith, but there's tons of people out there searching and who are hurting and who are lost and, and Jesus gives us comfort. And so I always like to tell what's the, it's uh, you know, the way I know and the way that's helped me. And so, you know, give it a try, come, come hear more. Um, so there's lots of ways to be invitational. And especially as we exit out of COVID, people are gonna be, I think, craving fellowship and communion with one another when we can gather back together in person. And so we're going to want to be as invitational as, as possible. But um, the good news here is that Jesus um, basically is making sure his disciples know who he is. He's the Messiah. Uh, and, and he's saying that he's going to build a kingdom. It's not going to be like one that we imagine on earth, right? It's a kingdom of community, right? Of being with one another, of being neighbors with one another, of taking care of one another, of loving one another. And that's some pretty good news. So final thoughts? All right, I will say a prayer and then I will share with you. I'm stuck on kids singing about uh, faith <laughs> today. So I'm going to show you a, a children's choir from Africa, from Uganda. But uh, let's close in prayer first. Let's pray. Almighty and loving God, we just thank you for this time to study your word and to gather again uh, as we study the gospel of Matthew. We uh, give you thanks that, uh, that we can grow and go deeper of faith and, and learn to um, think about uh, tough questions about uh, what kind of signs uh, we see in our world today um, of ways that you are active in our world. We read so many things that are bad news and horrible things that are happening. Sometimes it's hard to see uh, you anywhere, but you are there. You love us. You reach out to us. We see you in, in the helpers and the vaccine workers and in, in nature and all around. And so we give you thanks for the ways that you love us and come to us uh, and through miracles and through stories and through friends and through even quiet time. Uh, we just thank you uh, again for um, beginning your church as a community of, of sinners who have been saved and uh, who are called to love one another, to reach out to, to others with care and concern. Help us to continue to do that even in this difficult time and to love others, and to tell other people this good news of Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in your precious Son's name. Amen.